Uh, good evening, everyone. It's nice to see all of you. My name is Jim Ryan, and I am the dean of the Harvard Graduate School of Education. Uh, I want to give a special welcome to the members of the HGSE Visiting Committee, um, which includes several of uh, Professor Yoshino's overseers. Um, so I have known uh, and admired Kenji Yoshino, I was going to say for more than a decade, but I'm, I'm a little worried to say that it's actually close to two decades now. Um, when I recently had the privilege of hearing him present some of his work to President Faust and my fellow deans, I knew that we had to get him to HGSE, and I'm thrilled that he accepted our invitation. As you'll soon hear, his research and writing on the subject of what he calls covering is extraordinary, and I think it has profound implications for how we live, work, and engage with one another. And I think this is especially true with educators who work with students and colleagues of all abilities, backgrounds, and talents, and who must always remain aware of the conditions that can affect learning and student well-being. I think it's also especially relevant to the year-long conversation we've been having within this community about fulfilling the promise of diversity. Because the idea of covering sheds light on just what it takes to not only be a diverse institution, but an institution that values diversity, which means respecting and valuing difference and an individual's core identity or identities. At the same time, the idea of covering as I imagine you'll realize as you listen to Kenji, is an idea that can bring everyone together because we all engage in covering of one sort or another in different contexts. So in terms of how the evening will proceed, I'm going to first lavish some more praise on Kenji. Um, then he's going to speak on the topic of uncovering talent, a new model for inclusion for about an hour, and then open it up to your questions. And we'll go till um, 7.30 or so. So here's the. Um, praise part. Kenji is a renowned scholar of constitutional law, anti-discrimination law, and law and literature, and he brings his legal expertise to bear on civil rights issues that affect our daily lives and our personal relationships. He's been regularly called on by MSNBC, NPR, CNN, and PBS to comment on issues ranging from the legal struggle for marriage equality to the latest challenge to Obamacare, and he also became recently a regular contributor to the New York Times Magazine's podcast and column, The Ethicists. Now, to be sure, first-rate scholarship, influential journal articles, a public, president, a public presence might be expected from someone who attended Harvard College, then went to Oxford on a Rhodes Scholarship, and then to Yale Law School. What may be less expected, and what sets Kenji apart, I think, is the authentic warmth openness and artistic sense that he brings to his writing, his teaching, and his speaking. While he was a professor at Yale and now at NYU, where he is the Chief Justice Earl Warren Professor of Constitutional Law, Kenji wrote three books that are part legal analysis, part poetry, and part memoir, and that are truly works of art. The range of these books in and of itself is remarkable. One includes an analysis of Shakespeare's masterpieces, and their enduring relevance to modern day legal proceedings and current events. One covers the issue of covering, and the most recent is about gay marriage. Their quality and originality are unmatched. Each is truly unique and uniquely powerful, but you don't have to take it just from me. Consider the advanced reviews of Kenji's most recent book, which covers the Hollingsworth versus Perry decision that allowed gay marriage in California. It's entitled Speak Now, Marriage Equality on Trial, and is coming out in the next couple of weeks. And I will add, I think you can pick up a copy outside of the um, Asquith Hall. One reviewer wrote, the beauty and elegance of Yoshino's writing about law at times stops you short. Harold Coe is a former dean of the Yale Law School and former lead attorney of the State Department writes that Kenji's book pr proves anew that marriage is that sacred place where love meets law. This glorious human rights story, elegantly recounted by one whose own life has been transformed, should change forever the global conversation about the real meaning of same-sex marriage. And finally, the legendary Walter Isaacson, no slouch of an author himself, wrote that he had tears in his eyes by the end of the book. Or 
consider one of the many glowing reviews of Kenji's most well-known book to date, which we'll be hearing more about tonight. The book's entitled Covering the Hidden Assault on Our Civil Rights. Probably no one sums up this book better than a reviewer in O Magazine who asked, who'd expect a book on civil rights and the law to be warmly personal, elegantly written, and threaded with memorable images? The beauty of Yoshino's book lies in the poetry he brings to telling his own story. I am beyond delighted to have Kenji with us this evening as part of our year-long conversation on fulfilling the promise of diversity. And I ask you to please join me in giving him a warm, a warm welcome. Thank you so much, Jim, for that kind welcome. As uh, I recall it, we met in 1998, and even then you showed all of the qualities of kindness and decency that you show as dean every day and in this introduction tonight. I'm just going to dive right in. As Jim said, I value conversation, so I hope that uh, we can get through this presentation in about an hour and leave ample time for Q&A, because for me, that's the most exciting part, inevitably, of these uh, presentations. So uh, to introduce you to the concept uh, of covering, I first have to give you the impetus behind it, which is to think about the challenge that motivated um, the work. And in this iteration, uh, the data is going to be very corporate in nature uh, relating to the Fortune 500. And I'll explain why in a moment. It was kind of a departure for me, believe me, as someone who is more concerned and who cut his teeth more in civil rights than in thinking of corporations as people on the other side of the V, uh, rather than as somebody who uh, was going to join with them to create a paradigm of diversity and inclusion. But uh, this work has actually been generously co-partnered uh, by, or Deloitte uh, Management Consulting has generously co-partnered with me in a way that I hope that you'll find uh, very effective and illuminating uh, in this presentation. So if we start out in that context, there's no easier way to sum it up than to just look at the parlous statistics at the top of the profession. So uh, in 2015, 1% of Fortune 500 CEOs are black, 5% uh, are women, and 0.2% are openly gay. And it was only in the last year with Tim Cook coming out that I was able happily on one day to you know, change that number from a zero to a 0 0.2. Uh, so there's a long way to travel yet on all of these metrics. The hypothesis that uh, we need to generate here has to be something other than the pipeline, because the pipeline hypothesis of, well, there's just people in the pipeline, and this will be a self-correcting problem once people emerge from that pipeline, simply isn't holding true. Uh, the pipeline has remained robust along all of these uh, metrics for decades, and uh, w the gay example might be slightly different ways that we can talk about, but I think I can make the case that we should expect better numbers there, too, that we're not seeing. But nonetheless, we haven't seen the change at the top that we were promised so long ago. So my alternative hypothesis that I will uh, suggest to you today is that we are still asking people to choose between diversity and inclusion, that we don't have diversity and inclusion. We have diversity or inclusion, so that you can either be diverse and be excluded, or you can surrender that diversity to the extent that you can do so and gain some uh, grudging inclusion into uh, the mainstream institutions of this country. So that's a very abstract diatribe. So rather than leave it at that level of abstraction, which is too often, I think, where we leave it, I want to add some precision and rigor to this with the concept of covering. So the term covering comes from the sociologist Irving Goffman, who wrote a book in 1963 called Stigma, Notes on the Management of Spoiled Identity. And he defines covering as a strategy that individuals use in order to downplay known stigmatized identities. So he spends a very short time on this on his book. He spends about a page and a half on this. And I was so struck by this concept and so hungry for more that I kept looking in the secondary literature to see if anyone had taken up this ball and run with it. And no one had. So in 2006, I published a book called Covering uh, that the dean was kind enough to mention, 
And here again, I want to uh, recall to you that the way I'm defining covering is as a strategy through which an individual downplays a known stigmatized identity to blend into the mainstream. Covering differs from passing, which may be a term that's more familiar to you. And Goffman himself was quite smart about this. He's such a skilled expositor that often when you read him, you almost feel like you're speaking to him. So he says, some of you may be asking yourselves how covering differs from passing. And he gives the example of President Franklin Delano Roosevelt in order to drive home this point in, I think, an extremely powerful way. He says that before his cabinet entered, FDR used to always make sure that he was seated behind a table. And he wasn't passing because his cabinet certainly knew that he was suffering from a motor function disability and was confined to a wheelchair. But he was covering, making sure that his more conventionally presidential qualities, I am white, I am male, were in the foreground of the interaction. And his last presidential quality, pre last president, conventionally presidential quality, I am uh, a person with a disability, was in the background of the interaction. And we might say, well, uh, no harm, no foul. If that was his choice, uh, that was his choice. But we might also ask where the disability rights movement might be today if the most first powerful person uh, in the United States or indeed in the world uh, was also known to be somebody who was confined in a wheelchair and that was highlighted rather than downplayed in his interactions with the public. In this book, what I try to do as a value add to the initial move that uh, Goffman made is to break down this concept of covering along four axes. And you see my uh, weakness for alliteration here in that all of them begin with the letter A. So we have appearance, affiliation, advocacy, and association. Appearance-based covering has to do with how you uh, monitor and meld your presentation to the world, whether through grooming, attire, or mannerisms in order to blend into the mainstream. So an example might be an older individual dyeing his hair uh, to appear younger and more able to keep up. Affiliation-based covering has to do with how individuals avoid behaviors that are associated with their group, often to disarm people or often to uh, kind of undo the unconscious biases that might be triggered by their failure to do that uh, because of their stereotypes that they have about that group. So an example here might be the woman who doesn't talk about her children because she knows from Shelley Carell's research or just from life in the world that there is a motherhood penalty so that when women talk about having children, they get a financial hit. When men talk about having children, they get a financial bonus uh, because they are seen as the providers still who need to take care of their families. Advocacy-based covering has to do with how much you stick up for your group, and that could be anything from um, sticking up for somebody in the face of bias in a promotion decision to standing in the elevator and deciding whether or not to uh, respond to a joke that is directed against your group. So a veteran might decide to stand down rather than challenge an anti-military joke lest she be seen as overly strident. And then finally, association-based covering has to do with avoiding members of one's own group. And this has to do with uh, individuals, again, um, this has a, covers a range of activities from individuals saying, I'm not going to join that affinity group because that will label me as too much a part of this group, to individuals who are gay saying, I'm completely comfortable being gay, but I'm not going to bring my same-sex partner to this function uh, lest I be seen as too gay. Right? So there's some quantum of difference that is obnoxious uh, to one's peers even after uh, the talk of diversity and inclusion has completely permeated uh, the workplace and formal equality is taken as uh, a kind of uh, as table stakes for the conversation. So the first thing that I want to do is to just arm you with this vocabulary. So if you take nothing else away from this talk, I hope that you will take this term covering and the four axes of covering away from you, away with you, and hold them accountable to your own lives. Because I've yet to meet a person who, when confronted with a covering table, uh, being asked how do you cover along these four dimensions with regard to a stigmatized identity that you hold, who has been unable to fill out that table completely. Right. So, in other words, another way of saying that, again, to go to the dean's comment, is that in 2015, it is not completely normal right, to be normal on all dimensions in America. Right? Nobody is completely inside of the mainstream along all dimensions, therefore all of us will experience pressure to cover or downplay uh, stigmatize or outsider aspects of our identity. 
I think vocabulary is hugely important here. This uh, project actually came out of a despair about the law because I thought that the law could do something about this problem for reasons that I can go into during the Q&A. I came to realize that this problem was too infinite and too infinitesimal for the meat acts of the law to take care of, that it was better left to education and communities of conscience and compassion. And so therefore, you are actually a much more fitting audience for me to be addressing as future teachers uh, of America uh, than any group of lawyers uh, would be on this topic. Gloria Steinem once said that it was only when we found the term sexual harassment uh, that we could do anything about the problem because it was only then that the phenomenon became visible. And so my very aggressive and completely immodest aspiration for covering is that it gets hammered into our vernacular in the same way that sexual harassment or passing has now been hammered into our vernacular so that we can actually do something about it. I want to suggest to you that once you have this topic of covering in mind, we immediately see it everywhere in our popular space. So I've given just some examples, Margaret Thatcher, CBS News anchor Julie Chen, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, and President Obama, as examples of individuals who were subjected at key moments in their career to the covering demand. I've already done uh, President Franklin Delano Roosevelt and the way he covered his disability, so let me go to Margaret Thatcher and just throw it out to you uh, in the audience participation mode that I favor and to say, can anyone share with me how uh, Margaret Thatcher was told by her handlers to cover uh, both her gender and her class uh, before she ran for prime minister? I see a hand in the back, sir. Exactly right. So I'm going to repeat your comments because I have a microphone and you don't. Uh, and the uh, answer is uh, correct in that uh, she was told to go to a voice coach. Uh, put more pungently, her handlers told her that she sounded too much like a fishmonger's wife, which I think nicely compacts uh, the two dimensions on which her voice was deemed to be objectionable. Uh, first of all, there was a class issue. She was a grocer's daughter, and so therefore she needed to have her working class accent scrubbed in the view of these advisors. But second of all, her voice was deemed to be too, quote unquote, shrill, and in order to exude more gravitas and executive presence, she needed to have her voice lowered so that uh, she would be able to exude uh, that um, authority. And she did, and she succeeded. And as far as I know, to uh, make this point early on, she never complained about this, right? So I'm not saying that all forms of covering are bad. I'm not saying all forms of covering are experiences harmful to the individual. She could have just experienced this as a round of executive education, right, that uh, was ultimately uh, beneficial to her. But other cases are quite different. So uh, let's go to the case of CBS News anchor Julie Chen. How was Julie Chen uh, asked to cover her identity? Yes. Yes, exactly. So the answer was her eyes. Uh, she was a reporter for CBS, uh, or actually a, a preceding news organization, and was acing assignment after assignment. And her dream was to be a news anchor, uh, but she was never even allowed to compete for that position. So in a searing account that she gave just about a year and a half ago, uh, she told the story finally of how she made it as an anchor. And what she did was she cornered the producer and said, you keep telling me how wonderful I am, but uh, you never let me do what I actually want to do. So what's going on here? And he said, I don't think that you're ready for prime time yet. I don't think the American viewership is ready for you. And she said, what aren't they ready for? And he said, well, I think you're a little, you code as too Asian. Right? And keying off of the two comment, she inquired what quantum of Asianness was so obnoxious uh, to uh, the American viewer. And uh, you know, points for candor, the executive producer said, uh, it's your eyes. You know, they look robotic. They look indifferent. Uh, it looks like you're, not, you're bored by the stories that uh, you're talking about. And her uh, solution was to go to a plastic surgeon and have what's commonly known in the Asian community as a double eyelid surgery uh, or blepharoplasty, in which she had her eyes rounded to look more Western. And no sooner did she do that than she got the, her position as an anchor, and the rest is history. In her case, however, the reason that I say that this account was a searing one was that she said that half of her extended family disowned her after she uh, 
underwent the surgery because they thought that it betokened a lack of ethnic pride. And so for her, she said, the costs were very, very steep and that she had to make a tragic choice between her professional advancement and her connection to her family of origin and her community of origin. Finally, on a happier note, President uh, Barack Obama resisted a covering demand that was made of him. And so given that we actually didn't see the covering materialize, this may be a harder one uh, to pose to you. But what was the covering demand that his advisors gave him when he was first running for our national office as a US senator out of Illinois? Don't talk about race, Don't talk about race is one, certainly. Uh, not the one I'm thinking of. Yes? Yes, exactly. So we could say this is a subset of don't talk about race, but don't talk about race in the most um, primal way, which is about uh, one's name. So the audience member said he was told to change his name. Right? Uh, so he was uh, told, as he recounted to Charlie Rose uh, with his characteristic humor some years later, he was told that he couldn't have two weird names and win the presidency of the United States. So he was told you can either be Barry Obama as he was known when, uh, the moniker by which he was known when he went to Punahou High School in Hawaii, or you can be Barack Smith or Barack Jones or whatever the heck you want your last name to be, but you cannot be Barack Obama and win the presidency. And unfortunately for us, his uh, handlers can't really be accused of being you know, behind the times or uh, overtly bigoted or what have you because the social science data completely supports this result. So a landmark study that was done now some time ago, but um, about the time when he was being, being given this advice, by Sandil Mullenathan and Marianne Bertrand uh, at the University of Chicago, um, uh, uh, at the University of Chicago uh, Economics Department, found that uh, if you sent out two sets of resumes that were essentially identical, but you changed the names at the top, so that one set of resumes had Lakeisha or Jamal at the top, and the other set of resumes had Emily or Gregory at the top. The second set of resumes with the Anglo-sounding names got 50% more callbacks than the first set of resumes. So again, it was keying off of this knowledge uh, and this kind of conventional wisdom that his advisors were giving President Obama this advice. So regardless of where you are on the political spectrum, however, I think that we all take great um, pride and joy when another human being shows authenticity and courage and sort of stands up and says, this is who I am. Uh, and so I'm sure I'm not the only person whose heart swelled with pride uh, when Chief Justice Roberts asked uh, Barack Obama how he would like to be sworn in by, when he became president. And President Obama responded by my full name, Barack Hussein Obama. So if anything, he tripled down on his <laughs> bat. Uh, with uh, the American people in that moment. Okay, so uh, when we uh, think about how um, these examples can be called from the popular sphere, my book deals with this in the case law. So I'm a lawyer by training, so I did a deep dive into the anti-discrimination case law to find instances in which individuals were not being overtly discriminated against on the basis of their skin color or their chromosomes or their disability per se, but were nonetheless experiencing enormous pressure to downplay uh, their outsider attributes through behavioral cues that they were sending to the outsider, outside world on the order of covering. And discovering to my dismay that the law had very little uh, response to this and had very little to say about this uh, issue. So at the end of my book, I sort of, again, as I said, th throw out my hands and I say this is really not an issue for the law to take care of. It's really about uh, something that uh, organizations need to uh, take responsibility for doing. And then I uh, gave my book tour and then I put it away and then moved on to some other projects. About a year and a half ago, I got a life-changing phone call from the management consultancy Deloitte. And uh, my longtime uh, friend there, uh, and now colleague and co-author Christy Smith said, you know, I think that this could potentially be a game changer for the American workplace, uh, but you're never going to move the needle in the Fortune 500 or really anywhere else unless you have hard data. And so what we are willing to do is to open up our Rolodexes and our client relationships and to give you our analytics team, right, so that you can actually collect the data that would help us understand to what extent covering is a true phenomenon in uh, the American workplace today, 
and to what extent it is as detrimental to individuals as you say uh, it is in your book. If I can indulge in a moment of levity, the three months between when the survey was fielded and when the results came back were quite harrowing ones for me because I had, after all, already written the book. <laughs> so if the data had come back and so everyone had said, oh, this is, none of us do this and or we do this but it's not a problem, then I would have had some egg on my face. Fortunately for me and unfortunately for the world, the data came back to support my uh, thesis in spades. So, 61% uh, of respondents uh, said that they covered on a, at least one dimension. So uh, to fill in some blanks here, this is our first uh, response pool. We since have uh, increased the survey pool uh, significantly, but our first response pool was 3,129 uh, respondents across seven different industries uh, in the Fortune 500. Moving to impact, uh, when asked whether or not covering was uh, detrimental to their sense of self, and we took a relatively parsimonious definition of harm because we said somewhat to extremely detrimental to your sense of self. So not just some de minimis harm, but rather harm that would rise to uh, a level where you would actually begin to uh, describe it as somewhat to extremely detrimental or harmful. 60% to 73% of individuals, depending on the axis, said that it was somewhat to extremely detrimental to their sense of self. At that point, of course, uh, we have to ask where this is coming from, and so we turn to the suite of questions that ask where the source of the covering demand was, and a little over half of the individuals said that it came from their leaders, and a little under half said that it came from their organizational culture. We were very careful, by the way, to say organizational culture rather than ambient culture or familial culture or American culture because we didn't want to hold organizations responsible for things that were outside of their ability to control. In a way, you might say that this is a daunting statistic insofar as you see such a high number of uh, managers and leaders being accused of imposing covering demands in a supposedly uh, diverse and inclusive workplace. All of these organizations were deemed to be best-in-class organizations, as I'll talk about uh, a little bit more in a moment. But from my perspective, this is actually hopeful in a different way because if the problem had resided primarily in culture, let's say that the numbers were 10% leaders, 90% culture, I don't really know of any way to change culture other than through leadership. Right? And so if that had been the result, we would have already been at one remove from the problem. Whereas if the problem resides at least you know, slightly predominantly in leadership, then we know what to do, which is to say we need to go and educate the leaders and to have the leaders and the managers behave differently towards their teams. Taking a deeper dive into incidents, of that 61%, uh, the covering incidence was not evenly distributed. So 83% of LGB individuals reported covering, 79% of blacks, 66% of women, all the way down to 45% of straight white men. So, in some ways, the most surprising statistic here is the 45% of straight white men, because I'm sure many of you are saying this is the most empowered group. You know, why is it that uh, they are reporting such a high incidence of covering? And so we had the same question. We delved into the data, and we found that the most frequent qualitative responses for how straight white men covered had to do with age, you know, as mentioned in the example earlier, mental or physical uh, disability, think back to FDR, uh, socioeconomic status, so coming from a working class background or being a first gen uh, in the uh, professional workplace, um, veteran status, right, um, and a variety of other, you know, attributes. Uh, but we'll take a deeper dive uh, into that uh, cohort in a moment. But what I want to say for now is that that 45% really makes this a universal project. To say that this is not, you know, just a, a kind of um, plea for noblesse oblige on the part of straight white men uh, to engage in an act of uh, good-heartedness or sympathy towards groups that they don't belong to. This is a universal project of human authenticity which can genuinely be pitched in that way, which is to say if there are uh, demands for witless conformity that can't be justified according to organizational values, those can take a pinch uh, on uh, straight white men as well and they should be retired unless they can be uh, justified. I can also say that because uh, we make this genuine plea that straight white men be included in this paradigm, that the buy-in is much more immediate. 
you know, I can tell you that when covering the book came out, I would often get reactions like, Kenji, it might be hard to be a gay man, which I happen to be, uh, and you've talked very eloquently about the harms that society imposes on gay individuals, but, you know, I have cancer, and, you know, I've gone through chemo, and chemo has not been a picnic, and I have not passed, right, vis-a-vis -vis my colleagues, because when all your hair falls out, it's hard to pass, but I have covered you know, I have downplayed the fact that I have cancer because I worry that uh, people will lose confidence in me, that my longevity as uh, CEO will uh, go down if people perceive me as weak or vulnerable in some way. So if you come back with them and you say, I entirely agree, and you are part of this paradigm too, one of the great benefits of moving outside of the law is that we can truly be more inclusive, that's when all of that resentment immediately, and I mean immediately, shifts into solidarity. So imagine walking into an executive committee, as I've done uh, many times, which is vastly overpopulated by straight white men. If you're the diversity guy and you're about to give the diversity and inclusion talk, everybody is leaning back with their arms crossed. When we get to this slide, people uncross their arms and lean forward. And as one CEO said to me, this is a first inclusion paradigm in which I can see myself because I neither feel lionized nor demonized in it. Right? Because Historically, right, the idea is that straight white men are supposed to be either the knights who are supposed to come riding in on their white horses, the horses presumably also being heterosexual and male, right, <laughs> uh, to solve the problem, or alternatively demonized as a source of the problem who uh, have to come in and clean it up the mess that they've made. So if you frame this in non-gimmicky but truly authentic uh, terms as a project that is universal and it's uh, aspiration, then that's when you can get uh, individuals to pull together in a way that Robert Putnam and this uh, political science department has called bridging capital. Looking more closely at the source of covering, uh, this is actually what lights the fire uh, in the sense that of the 51% of people who said their leaders expected them to cover, uh, about 50% of them said that it somewhat to extremely diminish their sense of opportunities within the organization. And the same percentage, roughly, said that it's somewhat to extremely diminish their sense of commitment to the organization. You see that when we move, and this is intuitive, I think, when we move to organizational culture, the numbers drop down significantly. In other words, people take it much less personally when it's something in the water or in the air, as opposed to somebody who has uh, imposed this covering demand on them. I call this my money slide, even though there's no dollar figure on it, because once people see the slide, they see that they're hemorrhaging talent and engagement. Right? So 50% of 50% of your workforce is saying they feel uh, their sense of opportunities and commitment to the organization uh, diminished. That means if an organization can get this right uh, and another organization is getting it wrong, the first organization will eat the second organization's lunch. Right? And so this is the kind of imperative behind uh, why you would do uh, this just from the perspective of talent management and acquisition, even if you weren't doing it for altruistic or community building reasons. Now at this point, or perhaps long before this point, probably long before this point, many of you have been scratching your heads and saying, well, wait a minute, uh, Kenji, uh, surely you can't mean that all forms of assimilation are bad, and surely you can't mean that all forms of covering are bad, because as you said, you know, Margaret Thatcher didn't complain, and you yourself might be covering today for you to speak you know, English or to throw on a suit or to have manners are all forms of covering, right? Or, or at least forms of assimilation. So surely you can't be standing up here and saying that all forms of assimilation are bad. That sounds like a kind of adolescent, petulant position to take. And actually, I'm not taking that position. I'm not taking uh, the position or carrying the brief for the claim that all forms of assimilation are bad. Rather, what I'm trying to argue is that uh, against the countervailing presumption that all forms of assimilation are good. And I would argue that until quite recently, with our legacy of the melting pot ideal, the culture of this country has been very much the presumption that all forms of assimilation are good. Right? But once I admit to you that some forms of assimilation are good, I now have to answer the $64,000 question, which is how do we winnow out the forms of good assimilation from the bad forms of assimilation? How do we winnow out good covering from uh, bad covering? And I have a one word answer to that, which is values. And I think I can sharpen this up most easily through example by uh, talking about some of the qualitative responses we received on the survey. 
So many individuals on the survey said, I have to cover my political affiliation. So I have to cover the fact that I'm a Democrat, you know, in a conservative workplace. We've started to do this survey with schools now, so people say I have to cover the fact that I'm a conservative in a liberal educational environment. So it goes in both directions. And from my perspective, there's a no harm, no foul uh, argument to be made here, given that none of the organizations that we surveyed said we believe in uh, diversity of political affiliation, the ability to articulate that as one of our core values. Right? So at least there's no hypocrisy there. You could argue that they've gotten the values wrong, but you can't argue that they're not living up to their stated values. Whereas every organization that we surveyed said that we believe in inclusion on the basis of race and ethnicity, in this organization, and yet we found you know, qualitative data that repeatedly underscored how unwelcome racial minorities felt in uh, these environments. Right? So for example, uh, African Americans saying that when more than two of us are having a conversation, inevitably someone will walk by and say, is this an NAACP meeting? Is this a revolution? Are you plotting something? So as I'll say again later, sort of three straight white men uh, talking to each other is just a conversation, right? Uh, three ethnic minorities talking to each other is a revolution or plotting something or some kind of meeting and needs to be broken up. And that's the association-based covering demand of avoid people in your own group or you will uh, be asked to do so in subtle and unsubtle ways. So the idea is we've been living under these values for a long time, so now can we please live up to them? Right? And so we see a gap between talk and walk that is reflected in these numbers. 93% of respondents said that their organization talked the talk of inclusion, that it had inclusion as one of its core values. But of those organizations, there was a delta of 15%. The percentage fell to 78% when individuals were asked, does your organization li actually live up to those values? And covering, I think, is a major way in which uh, these organizations are not living up to those values. I mentioned earlier that there might be a uh, sampling bias in this data, and if there is a sampling bias, it is towards best-in-class organizations. Some of you might be surprised to see the 93% figure as being quite high. Right? The organizations that agreed to take our survey were organizations that had been repeatedly uh, lauded and given awards for their work in diversity and inclusion. They were the people who were ready to take our survey. The organizations that were the subject of class action lawsuits and the like ran screaming into the night uh, when presented with our survey because they knew that anything that they said on the survey could potentially be discoverable in litigation. So I think that that explains why the 93% figure is so high uh, and also why the 78% figure, by the way, is so high, but nonetheless we see a significant disparity. Okay, I now want to go into some case studies because I really think that the devil is in the details here. The uh, English professor, Elaine Scarry, once said that we need both narrative compassion and statistical compassion. And what she meant by that is that uh, some of us assimilate um, information better through stories and others of us assimilate it better through numbers. Uh, she gave the example of President Ronald Reagan. So here I will report, not endorse what she said. She said uh, that President Ronald Reagan had an enormous amount of narrative compassion and almost no statistical compassion. So she said he was the Teflon president for a reason. If you were a homeless person and you were crying, like he would tear up uh, listening to your story because he would have a genuine emotional response to your emotional response. However, if you flip from narrative compassion to statistical compassion and you showed him reams of data about homelessness, he would not be able to see the suffering embodied within those numbers. So I want to argue that we need both, and Scary obviously believes that we need both, and that for a project like this to work, you not only need the statistical data you know, that Deloitte was so insistent on my getting, but also the qualitative data that would make these um, narratives come to life. So, and in Deloitte's defense, they were completely on board with the idea that both are necessary. And so what you'll see here is the first case study of gender. The 66% uh, statistic uh, is already familiar to you, uh, but the matter to the right of it is not. And the matter to the right of it is what we call a covering box that takes the four axes of covering, appearance, affiliation, advocacy, and association, and then takes some of the most common open text responses that individuals had given to the survey uh, as uh, examples of how people might experience uh, these covering demands. 
So uh, under appearance, what we see is, you know, I wear clothes to appear more masculine, you know, and I uh, try to do things that are associated with men. Uh, with regard to affiliation, you know, I don't uh, talk about my children at work. Uh, with regard to advocacy, I don't suggest gender is an issue, even when I think that there's gender bias in the workplace. Of course, you might want to ask yourself whether it's better for the organization for that individual to speak up while the meeting is actually occurring, or whether or not it's better for the individual to keep quiet and let gender discrimination go on, and then ultimately speak up only when she's called uh, to the witness stand during trial. Uh, so this is not, uh, you know, you try and uh, uh, take the lawyer out of the research, but the lawyer always emerges, uh, I fear. And then finally, with association, I haven't joined the Women's Network because I believe that it would be a liability to my career. Right? So you could build a platinum quality Women's Network or Women's Affinity Group, you know, at the workplace level, at the faculty level, at the student level. But if individuals feel chilled from joining that because of association-based covering demands, then uh, they're not going to work. The second uh, case study that I want to spin you through, and this is the only other one I'll do, is race and ethnicity. And I want to just go through the four ethnicities that we studied in descending order of incidence of covering. So first of all, we have 79% of blacks covering. Uh, so with a respect to appearance, uh, uh, number one answer actually pertained to grooming. Uh, and straightening hair. So I was very uncomfortable wearing my natural hair to work and so ultimately straightened it in order to uh, make others around me more comfortable. Uh, there's actually, you know, as again, you lawyers in the audience know, a whole slew of cases uh, litigating, uh, cornrow cases and uh, other kinds of cases where African American women say we are the only ethnicity that is not permitted to wear our natural hair. So this is race discrimination and the courts routinely smacking them down. Affiliation-based covering, there's a perception that blacks cannot cut it in this department, uh, which happened to be a very technical department. It was the tax department. And so therefore, we work over time and put in 200% just to prove that we're more than capable. So I want to be really clear about what I'm taking aim at here. There's nothing wrong with giving 200%. There's not a single person in this audience who hasn't given 200% at work or in their studies, right? Uh, but to giving 200% because you're passionate about what you do uh, is engagement. Giving 200% because you belong to a particular ethnic group and you're worried about stereotypes leveled against your group is not engagement, that's fear, right? And it will ultimately lead to a diminution in engagement. Advocacy, too often when we speak up, we're seen as having an attitude or having a chip on our shoulders. And finally, association, the same claim that I make a concerted effort not to be seen around other African American professionals because I've seen the labels that are placed on individuals when they do so. So uh, this is one of the individuals who went on to say, um, asked if this is an NAACP meeting, but then there are many iterations of this uh, throughout the data. Latinos, 63% of Latinos cover, so under uh, appearance, avoid ethnic wear. Under affiliation, uh, Latinos are known for having large families. I don't talk about my six brothers and sisters because I'm afraid that it will trigger uh, assumptions that, or stereotypes that Latinos are poor or that we have large families. Ad Advocacy-based covering, there are times when people j crack jokes about being in Latino time, but I don't uh, challenge that lest I be seen as too much of a drag. And then finally, I don't want to be associated only with people who have my same ethnicity because it's restricted to genuine relationships outside of my group. Right? Asian American covering. 61% of Asians reported covering along at least one dimension. Uh, appearance, uh, this is one of my favorites. I, to overcome Asian stereotypes, I do my best to speak up, speak clearly, and carry myself in a confident manner. I got into a huge fight with the managing director of uh, Investment Bank uh, over this because he said, you should be thrilled that this is the message that our Asian American employees are getting because you're not going to rise to the managing director level unless you exhibit these characteristics. And so I said, well, hear me out for a second. You know, there's this you know, continent called Asia. They have leaders there too. They seem to be doing fine with their <laughs> different model of leadership. Nobody is saying that uh, these different models of leadership that Asians adhere to are in our DNA. They're clearly cultural, right? And so can't there be more than one script to borrow the term of the moral philosopher Anthony Appiah for what success would look like or what leadership would look like? 
And he still looked really unpersuaded, so I came back at him another time and I said, you know, well, have you read this wonderful book by Susan Cain called Quiet? Uh, the subtitle of the book is uh, The Power of Introverts in a World That Can't Stop Talking. Right? And she talks a lot about how we have had a shift, even in our own country, from what she calls a character model of leadership to a charisma model of leadership. So the charisma model of leadership, she says, took hold somewhere you know, after the 19th century when we all seem to subscribe to this notion of the charismatic leader, the Dale Carnegie, glad-handing, back-slapping leader, right? and that that was what leadership was all about. Whereas actually, she says, if you go back in time and you look at some of our most uh, renowned leaders, like Abraham Lincoln or James Madison or some of her examples, they're actually deeply introverted figures. And there was a character model of leadership that said, you know, at the time, you know, don't actually toot your own horn. Right? So it was actually much more similar to uh, Asian American styles of leadership or Asian styles of leadership, which she also covers in her book. So she talks in a chapter devoted to Asian Americans that talks about case studies from the Harvard Business School. Um, she talks about how the proverb in China is the loudest stuff gets shot. The proverb in Japan is a protruding nail gets pummeled. And the cognate proverb in the United States, on the other hand, is a squeaky wheel gets the grease. Right? And so I said as my final kind of uh, Parthian shot at this MD, you know, wouldn't it be great if we had directors like you who talk a lot, you know, but also directors like me who might talk less or who might listen, right? Actually, all my overseers are rolling their eyes because they know they talk a lot. I talk a lot at meetings, but uh, so I might not quite fit the profile. But it was a moment where I said listening that I got him because he said, uh, you've now persuaded me because we just spent a quarter of a million dollars persuading one individual on our executive team to shut up, right, and start listening. Right, so it would seem like a very simple message, but it turned out to be a very expensive and extensive one. Right? And so you're right, it might be better if we pluralize our conceptions of what constituted a good leader within this organization. Affiliation, I try to stay away from work that's stereotypical of Asians, for example, math. So imagine the future Fields Prize winner not concentrating in math you know, as an undergraduate here, simply because of his ethnicity. Um, the, troubling and certainly not um, optimizing uh, the talent of uh, the student body. Advocacy, I believe that organizations can do more to put minorities in positions of power, but I would never be a member of such an advocacy group. In association, I try to socialize with non-Asians. You know, this is a kind of through line or a drum beat that you can begin to see or hear. Finally, probably the slide you've all been waiting for, uh, straight white men. So 45% of straight white men report covering along one dimension. Uh, appearance, uh, the number one answer related to age. You know, I dye my hair so as uh, to look younger. This is actually also true on the other end of the age spectrum as well. So you saw Gen Y individuals saying, I wear prescriptionless glasses or uh, dress up in a suit, right, in order to look older. So everyone is trying to make it into the power bracket of the 40 to 60 year old uh, range, right, whether they're below it or above it. Affiliation-based covering, I felt pressure to cover having a stay-at-home wife uh, because I, want my wife to be, I don't want my wife to be perceived as a lesser woman or uh, that she chose to stay at home only because I made her. More on that in a moment. I feel that it could be detrimental, this is advocacy-based covering, to express my conservative views in light of the pressure of the current cultural climate. So what's interesting about the... Uh, middle two examples as opposed to the top example, is that many of the examples that we got were more like the top example in all candor, that uh, straight white men cover along attributes that don't implicate their straightness or whiteness or their maleness. So they cover along lines of disability, they cover along lines of age, they cover along the lines of socioeconomic status. However, right, I would say about 20% of the responses that we got in this category had to do with straight white men covering as straight white men. So we need to be mindful of the fact that straight white men, too, trigger unconscious biases, you know, to borrow from my dear friend Mazarin Banaji, who I was just talking to earlier uh, this evening, uh, and who is the uh, leader in the un unconscious bias literature, and I see it's just entered uh, here. Uh, so uh, good timing, uh, Mazarin. Um, uh, or it's just leaving now. Um, so maybe it was something I said. Um, but... Uh, 
one of the things that's wonderful about uh, Mazarin's work, one of the many things about uh, that's great about Mazarin's work, is that uh, we she shows in a similar move uh, to the one that I'm making, or I should probably say that I'm making a similar move to the one that she's making, that this is truly a universal phenomenon, that all groups trigger stereotypes, and that straight white men have stereotypes attendant to them as well, that they may feel the need to uh, disarm or diffuse, and they too may feel like they need to work their identity alongside their job. So there should be a lot of bridging capital here because we can chase each one of these axes across uh, these different cohorts and no cohort is immune, as I said, from these covering demands. And for those of you who have not already recognized this, I'm borrowing uh, the terms bonding capital and bridging capital from the Harvard political scientist Robert Putnam. Putnam says that bonding capital is a capital that we build within a group or a cohort. And he says bridging capital is a capital that we build across cohorts. So any one of these tables uh, should constitute bonding capital. But you can easily imagine my reconfiguring the table so that it chased a particular axis across all cohorts. And that would constitute bridging capital insofar as we would all realize that although we do appearance space covering in different ways, we all do it. However, there are some bridges that are bridges too far, and one of them in this instance was that we found no qualitative responses in this data set, again, of 3,000 plus respondents pertaining to association-based covering for straight white men. And that in itself provides a kind of key to understanding sponsorship and mentorship programs and relationships, and why uh, sponsorship and mentorship programs often fail, right, because again, you know, Minorities are subjected to the association-based covering demand. Women are subjected to the association-based covering demand, such they might uh, feel reluctant to avail themselves of these mentoring relationships even when they are extended to them, whereas uh, straight white men feel uh, like it's uh, completely invisible to them when they're mentored by another straight white man. That's just a mentoring relationship. It's not you know, colored or um, kind of affected in any way by their demographic attributes. Um, this is the kind of nerdiest of my slides, I'm afraid, so um, brace yourselves, uh, buckle your seatbelts. Uh, but I figured if I can't do this at Harvard, where can I do it, right? Uh, so this is my intersectionality slide. Uh, many of us belong to more than one identity. Uh, one of the things that it makes me very proud about the strength of this analytic is that we can slice the cohorts as uh, thinly as we want them. So that if we wanted to look at, say, women of color, or more specifically, in this instance, black women, we could do that. So for those of you who are not familiar with the terminology, intersectionality is a term that was at least popularized, if not coined, by the law professor Kimberly Crenshaw. And what she studied was class actions brought by black women. And what she realized is that black women consistently lost their class actions. And she was trying to figure out why this was, you know, because they lost them disproportionately to uh, black men or white women. So what would happen in these cases is that the judge would say, has there been discrimination on the basis of race? And the judge would say, no, because I see that some black men have made it to the executive level. Then the judge would say, okay, we're done with the race discrimination claim. Let's turn to the gender discrimination claim. Has there been gender discrimination here? And then the judge would say, no, because I see some white women have made it to the executive level. And so you know, the gender discrimination claim is also dismissed, and then the case is over because those are the only two claims that were brought. Who falls between those two stools? Women of color, right? And so the idea here, right, according to Crenshaw, is that not only are black women under a double cloud, but also that the totality of that experience is greater than the sum of its parts, right? And the remedies that we have are uh, completely underserving, right, uh, that community as a strictly legal matter. More recently, and interestingly, uh, Catherine Phillips of Columbia Business School has come into the fray and said, actually, there may be more latitude for women of color who are um, particularly black women because the stereotypes cancel each other out. So she told a diametrically opposite story and gave a different hypothesis and theory from that of Crenshaw saying, you know, if the stereotype about women is that they're retiring or they're timid or they're shy, and if the stereotype about African Americans or blacks is that they're strong or aggressive or what have you, you can't hold both of those stereotypes in your head at one time, so black women could actually be advantaged rather than disadvantaged relative to black men or white women. So I always look at these theoretical disputes and I think, well, this is really, really interesting, but ultimately, like, this is not a theoretical dispute, it's an empirical dispute, right? So like, there's a right answer here, right? And so the first data cut that I asked for when we got this data back, and I breathed my sigh of relief after, you know, my theory was not proven to be 
uh, completely wrongheaded. The first data cut that I asked for was a cut of white men, white woman, black men, and black women, and how they covered along the four dimensions. And the result is this uh, rather wonky uh, spider chart. So uh, just to decode this for you, the four axes of the chart are the four axes of covering, uh, appearance, affiliation, advocacy, and association. And uh, the border of the chart is 0% covering, right? so no covering whatsoever. So in terms of authenticity and comfort level and the ability to be yourself in the workplace, a bigger diamond is a better diamond. So what we see is that uh, white men in the green have the biggest diamond. And then nested slightly within them uh, in black are uh, white women. So this gives credence to Frank Dobbin here in the sociology department uh, who says that white women tend to be the initial and early beneficiaries of diversity and inclusion initiatives. Then you see a large jump to black men and then a smaller jump to black women. So I looked at this and I said, this is a publishable result, right? Because it shows us two things. First, it helps us arbitrate between the two theories, at least with regard to covering. So I don't want to say this is a theory of everything. I, I don't want to say that Phillips is categorically wrong and Crenshaw is categorically right. But Crenshaw is right with regard to covering, right, according to our data, right, which is to say that uh, black women are disproportionately disadvantaged rather than advantaged by belonging to the intersection of the two groups. Also, we see from this that the race effect vastly outswamps the gender effects because the gender diamonds are closely nested within the uh, other gender diamond within the same race, right, uh, whereas uh, the race diamonds are very far apart from each other. Finally, uh, solutions. I'm sure at this point you're all sufficiently depressed that you're eager to hear about what you can do tomorrow uh, to uh, start helping people, uh, your organizations retire these covering demands. So let me talk a little bit about solutions. Uh, in the interest of uh, transparency and disclosure, I should say that this is very early days of research for us. So we're just setting baselines at this point, right, in order to test whether these interventions would be uh, effective, what we would need is to be able to get into an organization, test it at a certain level, you know, wait, you know, intervene, and then test it again to see if the intervention had been effective. And so this is a longitudinal uh, study that I expect to be involved in for a very, very long time. So these solutions are just back formations from what we hear uh, people saying, uh, identifying as a problem. In other words, they're trying to simply reverse the uh, arrow of the covering demand. So when we think about appearance-based covering, this is all review on the left-hand side. Appearance-based covering is pressure to change your self-presentation, physical self-presentation, in order to blend into the mainstream. And examples might be uh, pressure felt by black women to straighten their hair, or pressures felt by uh, individuals uh, to use wheelchairs instead, uh, canes instead of wheelchairs, which is one that came up uh, repeatedly in the disability context. So, you know, you could ask too, you know, uh, about FDR. Sure, FDR might not have uh, been disadvantaged, but uh, the person who switches from a wheelchair to a cane who reports feeling pain all day, but would rather suffer that pain than, you know, feel the discomfort of other people around them when he or she wheels into a room, as, again, as was reportedly repeated was repeatedly reported in the data, uh, is something uh, that is you know, physical pain. So it's hard to dismiss that as simply being you know, psychological or uh, de minimis pain that the individual is um, uh, burdened with. So what would our proposed solution be? Our proposed solution here is to encourage the retirement of comments about physical appearance that are not entirely consistent with organizational values. So taking the top example, uh, many black women in our survey said as a complaint that whenever they straightened their hair and they went into the workplace, they would get a raft of comments from all of the uh, individuals in the workplace uh, who did not belong to their own ethnicity and sometimes individuals who did. Right? And so you might think, well, you know, that's a compliment. So what exactly is the problem here? And the problem is that the compliment is still a cue that the natural hairstyle is not acceptable, and African Americans, again, are the only ethnicity who is not permitted, who are not permitted to wear their natural hair, right? And so the compliment is a nudge, right, uh, towards a certain kind of behavior that can also be an unwelcomeness cue, 
right? So unless you do a little bit of soul searching, right, before you start uh, making editorial comments about other people's behavior, right, we're not going to be able to get at the kind of infinite and infinitesimal interactions uh, that we all engage in that could uh, cumulatively push people outside of the mainstream. Second, uh, when we get to affiliation-based covering, uh, this is a pressure to avoid uh, behaviors identified with the group, often to avoid stereotypes about the group. So the examples that I gave are pressure uh, felt by women to downplay their childcare responsibility, pressure felt by Asians to hide proficiency in math or science. So I'm sorry Mazarin uh, had to go, uh, but because uh, this is a great shout out to her, take the implicit association test designed by uh, Banaji and her colleagues. I mean, this is really a tremendous uh, life work. Uh, just Google uh, implicit association test or go to the website that's in the note uh, in the slide uh, to take the test to determine and self-diagnose the extent to which uh, there are deep ways in which we still have unconscious biases and associations between demographic groups and particular characteristics. That in itself is kind of a diagnosis uh, to a diagnosis, right? So I want to also give you an action item. So the action item here would be to embrace the insights of the Share Your Story campaign. The Share Your Story campaign was a campaign that was adopted by Deloitte, and it was not adopted in response to uncovering talent, but it grew out of the same ethic of authenticity that motivated uncovering talent. So Share Your Story was a campaign where uh, Deloitte videotaped its top 60 leaders from the CEO down, sharing their story. And the short stories that they shared were not their resumes, but rather something that was warmer and more personal. So Joe Echeverria, the uh, first uh, Latino CEO of one of the big four accounting firms, said that when he first came to Deloitte, he was told to shave off his Frito Bendito mustache and to lose his polyester leisure suits. Right? And he covered appropriately in response to that demand, and he became a CEO. Right? So you might think, you know, Okay, you covered, but you became CEO, right? You know, so that's great. But, right, as Deloitte goes on to underscore, right, the hope is that the next generation of Latino analysts are not put to this tragic choice, right? Because Echeverria and other contacts has said that this came at a great personal cost to him insofar as it had effects within his own family of origin and his communities, much in the way that it had effects for Julie Chen. Share your story can be ambitious. You know, it can be videotaping your top 60 leaders, or it can be pervasive and incremental in a way that all of you could implement tomorrow, right? So another uh, part of the Share Your Story ethos at Deloitte is that before any Deloiter gets up to make a speech and introduces themselves, they always include some non-professional aspect of themselves in their introduction. So you can't be what you can't see, right? And often you can't see many attributes that would place individuals who are leaders outside of the norm unless the leaders are willing to share their stories, right? So unless I stand up before you and share my story, as I'll do at the end of this presentation, I think that you won't have a full understanding of why I care so much about this work, right? And I also suspect that uh, the temperature and the sense of warmth in the room will be different after I've shared my story uh, than it was uh, before, in a good way. OK, with regard to advocacy-based covering, so again, this is uh, pressure not to stick up for other group members. And so here we see uh, the pressure by Latinos uh, not to uh, combat jokes about being on Latino time. You could substitute any ethnicity or any cohort, really, in any joke uh, pertaining to that group, and it would still hold through. We saw this just across the board uh, in our survey. And then pressure felt by uh, women uh, not to speak up about the possibility of gender bias, which again is an example that we've already seen. So endorse the speak up culture is one. Uh, Pfizer, among many other organizations, has adopted a speak up culture uh, that says we actually want our employees to feel empowered and we're explicitly inviting you to speak up about all things, including uh, diversity and inclusion issues. But I also want to, borrowing from the sexual assault literature, endorse uh, as a potentially more innovative uh, solution in this field, uh, the ethical bystander culture. And what I mean by the ethical bystander culture is this notion that we are each other's keepers to a much greater extent than 
uh, we may have experienced to be the case a generation or two ago in the sexual harassment realm. And I want to advocate that the same has to be true more generally in the diversity and inclusion realm. So in the uh, sexual assault realm, when I was an undergraduate at Harvard College, I graduated in 1991, if I saw two individuals leaving a party and one of them was intoxicated such that they were unable to give consent, you know, this may have just been me, right? But my notion was I should just butt out. You know, unless one of these individuals is my friend, right, I have no business going in and interrupting uh, that interaction. But now, one of the solutions in sexual assault that's been uh, seen to be very, very promising is the idea that you want to flip the script and to say, actually, this is kind of like drunk driving, and you don't let people who are clearly drunk drive, right? So you don't let people who are clearly bereft of consent go into situations, right, uh, which could be harmful on both sides, right, uh, both with regard to the person uh, who isn't drunk, uh, but also with regard to the person who is. So the ethical bystander culture means that we have an obligation to intervene, and I think this is particularly relevant on the advocacy-based covering front uh, because of the importance of allies. If somebody makes an anti-gay joke right, in my presence in the elevator or you know, in a faculty meeting, I probably, as a gay man, am the last person, I'm the least well-equipped person to respond because I'll worry that I'll either overreact right, and seem thin-skinned Right, or like a live wire, or I'll be afraid that I'll underreact right, and then have to go home and feel completely ashamed of myself for not having the uh, guts to stick up for myself in that interaction. So there's no way I can really calibrate, particularly in a slice of time, what the correct response should be. The person who is much better able to make that response is the ethical bystander who doesn't uh, belong to that group, who says, I think that that was an inappropriate comment, or you know, if I were gay, I think that that would be really offensive to me. Um, please you know, think twice before you make that kind of a comment. So we all need to be ethical bystanders vis-a-vis -vis each other, because we can say on each other's behalf things that are very hard to say on our own behalf. Right? And so that's uh, one solution that we have to the advocacy-based covering demand that I think is going to be very promising here as in other contexts. Finally, and this is my last slide, so please prepare your questions. Uh, with regard to association-based covering demand, which again is pressure to avoid contact with other group members, examples here uh, would be uh, pressure felt uh, by the non-dominant group to um, avoid affinity groups or mentorship or sponsorship by somebody of their own group. But also, more specific in groups, uh, idiosyncratic, uh, if I can put it that way, uh, pressures like pressure felt by LGBT, uh, individuals not to bring their partners to work functions. So here, you know, the dominant answer, which is already well understood in the literature, is again on the grounds of allyship, sponsor, and affinity groups. So to have a leader who is not part of that demographic group sponsor the affinity group shows that anyone is welcome to join, and it's certainly not going to be a block to your advancement if you join this group if the CEO or uh, one of the C-suite um, uh, individuals is actually the uh, official sponsor of the group, and the sponsor himself or herself does not belong to the demographic uh, 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 group uh, on which the affinity group is constituted. But uh, also, uh, some of the interventions here, and this is actually a hopeful note, can be very, very mild or de minimis. So this goes into the nudges versus shoves literature, where sometimes very soft nudges can be just as effective, if not more effective, than hard shoves. Uh, this is the Kahneman-Tversky literature, among others. Uh, so uh, send friendliness cues uh, to counteract cohort-specific demand. So one thing that uh, CEOs have done in recent years is to say at the beginning of every fiscal year when the, this is a new fiscal year email goes around, to send around an email that says, this year I just want to remind you that when we say uh, you're welcome to bring your spouses to these certain events, we also mean same-sex partners, period. That's all the signal that needs to be sent. And that kind of what Lani Gunier here at the law school calls friendliness cue is all that's needed to invite uh, the conversation and to nudge somebody from not uh, bringing the same-sex partner to bringing the same-sex partner. It can be as tiny uh, of an intervention as that. I want to conclude uh, on a more personal note before opening this to conversation and questions by saying I've touted the benefits of Share Your Story so um, loudly that I fear that I would be remiss if I didn't uh, do so myself. So 
Uh, let me share two stories from different ends of my career that pertain to covering that might give you some insight about why this uh, continues to be a passion uh, for me. So when I first started as a junior faculty member at Yale Law School in 1998, I uh, thought I had uh, I was done with managing my sexual orientation because I went on the job market very self-consciously as an openly gay man. Uh, but no sooner did I start to walk the halls of Yale Law School as a faculty member than a very fr well-meaning, very friendly colleague put his arm around my uh, uh, shoulders and said, Kenji, you'll do a lot better here if you are a homosexual professional than a professional homosexual. And I knew exactly what he meant. He meant I do much better as a person who taught mainstream constitutional law, separation of powers, federalism, uh, judicial review, and just happened to be gay as a kind of extracurricular activity than I would do if I taught gay rights subjects, litigated gay rights cases, you know, spoke out on gay rights issues to the press, um, and uh, sort of made that part of my portfolio. And so he was essentially making what I would call either the affiliation or the advocacy-based covering demand on me. And perhaps to my discredit, uh, such was the terror of the tenure track that for the first couple of years I acceded to this. But all the major gay rights cases like Romer and its sequels were breaking, same-sex marriage was finally on the radar, and I just felt like I couldn't sit on the sidelines. And so finally I decided that I'd much rather not get tenure as somebody who I was than to get tenure as somebody who I wasn't. And so I decided that I was going to go back to doing all the things that I was passionate about. And all of my colleagues, except for the one, embraced me at that moment and said, where have you been for the past two years? This is the person whom we hired. Right? And so I think that we often forget that, uh, that um, going along to get along is often the message, right? but that what makes us truly unique, truly passionate, truly make, able to make our individual contributions is the uncovered. Uh, part of ourselves, right, is the part of ourselves that is outside of the mainstream because that's a part that actually adds some diversity or difference to the mix. Uh, a few years ago, I moved from Yale uh, to NYU uh, for spousal reasons. My husband is in New York. We now have two kids, so we wanted to be in the same city. And uh, you can't, at that point, I was tenured in chair at Yale, and you can't um, get somebody to leave an institution who has a chair without offering them a chair, as many of you in the audience know. I thought I was done with covering by this point, in the sense of not just intellectually, but I thought in my personal life and professional life, I thought I was done. So it actually came as somewhat of a surprise where I was confronted again with a covering dilemma that made me lose some uh, sleep, where uh, Ricky Revez, then the dean of NYU School of Law, where I now teach, called me up and he was very proud of himself and he said, you know, we have just uh, created a new chair for you and it's called the Earl Warren Professorship of Constitutional Law. And I hope that you will understand how much thought went into this and I hope that you will embrace this chair because you would be the first person to sit in the chair and Earl Warren so embodied uh, both the values of constitutional law and the values of civil rights that are your academic portfolio. So we hope that you understand uh, what this means and we hope that you will accept it. And he fully accepted that, expected that I would say, yes, you know, wonderful. And there was a very long pause where I was kind of just choking down uh, my uh, discomfort where I was desperately trying to uh, resist the desire to simply roll over and accede to this advocacy-based covering demand, this time on the basis of ethnicity, but ultimately realized that I wouldn't be able to do it. So I finally said, Ricky, I can't take that chair. And he was gobsmacked. And so he said, why not? And I said, well, uh, as you may know, as Attorney General of California, Earl Warren uh, superintended the internment of the Japanese. I am of Japanese uh, descent. And I'm afraid I quoted some Audrey and Rich to him. And I said, I cannot be honored uh, by uh, someone who has so dishonored my people. Right? So um, pretty hard to come back from that. Uh, and so uh, Ricky, to his credit, and he's a wonderful human being and dean, said, I totally understand that. Just give me a few days. I'll come back. Um, four days later, he calls me back and he says, I have another chair for you. I say, great. <laughs> Terrific. Let's hear it. And he said, uh, I now would like to offer you the Chief Justice Earl Warren Professorship of Constitutional Law. So the only addition were the words Chief Justice before the chair that I just rejected. 
So there's another ringing silence, but this time the quality of the silence is very different. It was not me sort of choking on my own discomfort. It was me sort of saying, somebody on this phone call is crazy, and I'm pretty sure it's not me. <laughs> um, and so I said, what difference could that possibly make, Ricky? You know, so we're pressing a lot of responses, trying to be as low-key and as polite as possible. And Ricky uh, said, in words that I will never forget, uh, I have read a biography of Earl Warren in the intervening days since our last conversation, and I've discovered that as, Ch as Chief Justice of the United States Supreme Court, uh, Earl Warren said that the thing that he most regretted in his career was the internment of the Japanese. And so given that your project of diversity and inclusion is to take people from their present position on the diversity and inclusion maturity curve and bring them far, as far along that maturity curve as possible, wouldn't it be wonderful to have the name of somebody who had traveled so far over the course of a single lifetime? Right? And to have the name attached to your chair that symbolized the end of that journey rather than the beginning of that journey. And so I said, that chair, uh, Ricky, I will take. So uh, thank you for your kind attention. I stand before you as the Chief Justice or Warren Professor of <laughs> Constitutional Law, uh, and I'm delighted to take your questions at the mics. Thank you. So if you could just tell me your name, and, and if you care to, your association with the school or the community would be great. Oh, yeah. Uh, hi, my name's Ruben. I'm a sophomore at Harvard College. And first, just like kind of a fan person moment for me. So your, the book covering is the only book that I've read twice. Um, and I don't know, I told an English professor of mine that once before. And he said, wow, that's high praise. You should tell him if you get a chance. So <laughs> I figured I'd tell you. Uh, so thanks for writing a great book. Um, uh, thank you for the high praise. <laughs> uh, but besides that, I guess my, I'm actually still really interested in education, even though I'm not at the grad school of education yet. Hopefully, fingers crossed. Um, <laughs> um, <laughs> but uh, my question is, how do you think some of the solutions here that you apply for the workforce can be related to uh, the school, I guess? Because for me, I think of school as being a big place of where people are learning the cultures that they eventually embrace you know, in the workplace and in other parts of their lives. So what do you think we can do to make it to where people are learning some of these things much earlier so that when people of different minority groups or uh, facets of their life got to the workforce, it wasn't as much of a problem? Yeah, so that's a wonderful question. Thank you uh, for that. Um, so we are looking at this uh, at the school level. So uh, Deloitte, to its, again, great credit, has said that it will look at uh, administer the survey to schools as well as workplaces. We're just starting to get that data back um, in order to make sure that the schools themselves are anonymous. I'm not going to, uh, we've had so few school participants that I'm not going to report out that data because I don't, I, I want to protect it um, and I don't want to get ahead of my skis. But the top line is that we see very, very similar things happening at an earlier stage. So uh, the idea that you know, there's this big, bad you know, corporate workplace out there and that you know, the school is a safe haven uh, is a chimera. That's that, that we have not found to be the case. And so uh, as we go on, I hope that we're able to administer the survey and uh, deeper and deeper down the educational curve so that ultimately we're doing it at you know, high schools and primary uh, schools. My research arc, you know, uh, ideally would be to partner with uh, social scientists and then follow Mazarin's path, right? Because Mazarin started with an unconscious bias again in the workplace, but now she's doing it. I said, how, how early do you test for unconscious bias? And she said, how old are your kids? I have a daughter and a son. The daughter is three, the son is two. And she said, oh, your daughter's old enough to be tested by me, but your son isn't, right? So that should give you an idea of how deep down she's going. So I totally agree with you that the earlier we make these kinds of solution interventions, once we determine which ones are the most effective, uh, the better, because this kind of stuff starts very early. These social dynamics happen very early, uh, the better. Uh, so, you know, if, if part of that was, why do we start with, with corporations? We started there because uh, we fish where the fish are. You know, these are the contacts that Deloitte had who were willing to take the survey, right? But ultimately, we hope to uh, drill as deeply as we can, precisely in order to get the, uh, 
um, the responses uh, or the, the data uh, that would um, suggest uh, interventions at the educational level and not only um, at the workplace level. Because I entirely agree with you that this happens long before uh, people hit the workplace. It happens when they're being educated uh, and professionalized in a way uh, for the workplace, if not before. So thank you. Oh, yeah, and thanks, thanks for reading my book twice. Oh. <laughs> I'm going to alternate. Yeah, Jay Wallace. Um, not long ago, not long ago, there was a Mozilla executive uh, who was forced to resign from the company as a result of a political contribution he had made to Proposition B in California. Uh, should you have to cover up your political and cultural uh, views and uh, uh, beliefs uh, if they don't conform to certain, what you might call politically correct, uh, shibboleths? Uh, it, what you do in your private time? Uh, then becomes an issue uh, within the workplace if uh, particular individuals in the hierarchy don't uh, agree with your political views. Great. Uh, so another really terrific question. Um, this goes back to um, the values slides. Remember I told you that I had a one-word answer uh, for um, whether or not a covering demand was a good demand or a bad demand, and that one-word answer was values. So it really depends on what the values of the organization are. In a way, this project, at least in this iteration of it, is a very modest project. We're not here to dictate values to organizations. We're just trying to help organizations live up to the values that they've stated, right? So in this instance, right, in the Mozilla case with Brendan Eich being forced to resign, do I think that he should have been forced to resign? No. But do I think that Mozilla has the right to, you know, have him retire because one of its values is inclusion on the basis of sexual orientation? Yes, right? So one of the things that's interesting is that this has to be a conversation, right? So I've thus far talked about the values of organizations as if they were set in stone, but this can actually be a conversation between the organization and its people. And again, if I can uh, use a bit of levity here or, 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 or use a, a, a a little bit of humor, but it's actually quite a serious example of how this can actually be a, a cycle rather than a unidirectional um, kind of diktat, so that it's always more interesting when the pressure of application goes both ways, and it's not just values being enforced on a group of people, but the people talking back, as you're talking back now, saying those are the wrong values, so the values can be reshaped by the groundswell of opposition that rises up from the organization. We actually had an instance of that where we were actually asked to help an uh, organization that had just acquired a very cutting edge design firm uh, to do web design. So the host organization, the acquiring organization, was a very conservative organization. The acquired company was very, very avant-garde. And the avant-garde company was full of gen wires and they came in with face tattoos and piercings and dyed hair and pets. The pets part is my favorite. And their first day at work after they had been acquired, uh, they were turned away at the door by security and by the receptionist because the receptionist said, you, I think you're in the wrong place, right? So worst first day of work ever, engagement survey goes through the floor, they come to us and they say, what should we do? And we say, well, it's actually complicated in the way that the answer to your question is complicated because what value are you trying to impose here, right? And their response was, well, there's more than one value, because on the one hand, we're a very conservative firm. We present that way sartorially to our clients and to the outside world. If people run around saying that they're our employees and they have face tattoos and piercings and things like that, you know, that's uncomfortable for us. It could also create slippery slope concerns, right? Uh, because we had this experiment with Casual Fridays, you know, two years ago, and that was a disaster, right? <laughs> on the other hand, they had the introspection to admit that innovation was another one of their values. And they said, we hired these people because they were able to do something that we ourselves could not do in-house, right? And so we said to them, is it really worth it to you to have a battle over dress code with these individuals for six months or a year or five months? Or might it be better to give them the accommodation, right? And then not cut off your nose to spite your face because you're not gonna get the best work out of them if you're fighting with them all the time about how they show up for work. So essentially, it was a battle between innovation and uh, this sartorial conservatism. And it, from there, I mean, innovation ended up winning in the sense that they did ultimately choose to uh, take the more inclusive attitude. But the point I want to make, sir, that's pertinent to what you just said is that this is a scenario where the values were not set in stone, right? So 
what I'm trying to say is that oftentimes the people rise up and they say, give us a different set of values because these values simply aren't working for us. Right? And then the organization changes its values. So it's always a dialogic conversation. I never want to say there are these values that you know, are set in stone universally and then those are just simply imposed in the workplace. So it may be at some point that someone says the desire to, uh, the, the, it should be a value of this organization for me to be able to state my political affiliation without fear of reprisal, without fear of ostracization. Um, and, and that could be a useful conversation to have. In a way, the challenges that I'm trying to solve here are much more modest in that they are uh, values that produce a lot of uh, low-hanging fruit in the sense of we all agreed after immeasurable human uh, suffering that you know, inclusion on the basis of race and ethnicity is just a core non-negotiable value and very few people are speaking out against that, right? So from my perspective, that's where I want to start from the operational level. In a sense, the conversation you were talking about with Mozilla possibly having the wrong values or the dialogue that I was talking about uh, this acquiring firm having engaged in with the firm that it acquired, you know, those might be more complex things, but they're very easy, analytically easy things that we could be doing right now where everybody agrees what the value is and the only question is whether we're just living under those values or whether we're actually living up to them. Hi, thank you. My name's Elena Harper. I'm a second year doctoral student in the Educational Leadership Program here at HGSE. My question is um, for a little more clarity on the ethical bystander solution. And the question sort of centers around the fact that one of the areas in which I'm studying and interested is in how communities from within themselves empower themselves through either the idea of counter narratives or community organizing to represent their own interests. And when you're talking about the ethical bystander, at least with the example that you gave, you're talking about someone from outside of that group mm -hmm. standing up for someone who is within the group that's being affronted. So my question is really around if you have seen any negative effects on the um, self-efficacy that the person for whom has been uh, who has been stood up for feels in that instance because yeah. of a um, you, you, like a disempowering almost of my voice is not heard even despite because oftentimes those people are in the situation myself included as a black woman I was just snapping to all those things you were saying um, as you know uh, they they feel they they're very pra they're practiced at overcoming some of those initial um, uh, fears hesitations and so I was just wondering if you could speak a little bit about that. Yeah, so that's a great point. So let me under let me uh, make sure just to fix ideas that I've gotten your question correctly. So as I heard the question, the question was, uh, could there be some unintended negative consequences to being an ethical bystander because uh, you're speaking on behalf of somebody else who might actually feel uh, more disempowered by dint of the fact that you've chosen to uh, be the the white knight, uh, so to speak, and to speak on their behalf, right? Correct. So. That's a great question. So I've gotten the question. I read yes, it correctly. Perfectly. Yeah. Okay. So that's a great question. And that's something that uh, I'll definitely think about as we as we test this uh, solution. But as I said, we don't have you know anything other than conjecture at this point. So this is a hypothesis of something that might work. We need to test it as an intervention to see if the negative, mm -hmm. right, unintended negative knockoff effects uh, occur. You know, just anecdotally, right? I would say that. Uh, I think a lot of it depends on, you know, time, place, and manner issues. You know, as a member of the gay community, I can say that we would be nowhere if we didn't have allies speaking up for us. And someone speaking up for us doesn't necessarily have to be done in such a way that it deprives us of the capacity to speak for ourselves, right? So that's uh, one idea. The other idea is that I think a lot of it might also have to do with how much the notion of allyship is fully symmetrical or not. So if it's always a dominant group that is saying, oh, I'm your ally and I'm going to speak up for you, uh, that might be very different from saying, you know, in this instance, I'm going to speak up for a woman, right? In another instance, a woman is going to speak up for me as a gay person. And it's not clear, right, who is more empowered, right, in that exchange over time. What's clear is that we're allies, right? So again, this is all at the level of conjecture, but I think that a lot of it will, I think the devil there is going to be in the details as to whether or not we can actually minimize, right, the negative knockoff effects that you're talking about. Thank you.
Yes, sir. Uh, how's it going? Uh, my question was actually along the same lines. It was actually like the exact same question that she asked, kind of. Okay. So I, I guess uh, to be more general, what I was wondering is that it's like certain aspects of an organization can be governed by rules. So when you think about a black woman saying you can say, you can wear your hair however you want to work. Like how do you, I was wondering how does an individual within an organization help change the social climate from the, the less explicit ways that people are, are uh, kind of marginalized. So when an individual comes up to you and puts their arm around you and says, maybe you shouldn't do this, I wonder how can an individual, but not necessarily a larger organization, how right. can you affect change, especially when you could possibly make somebody that is a part of the, the non-dominant group make them uncomfortable at the same time? Excellent. Thank you. Um, so if this were a matter of law or policy, right, um, then it would be very, very easy uh, to s solve. Or put differently, if this were an easy problem, then law or policy would be able to solve it. And the fact that law and policy have been so inefficacious in uh, solving these issues uh, beyond just setting a certain floor Right, suggests to us exactly that the dynamic is much more fine-grained and complicated and individualized in places that policies can't reach. Right, because, you know, no matter how much I resent what my colleague said to me, even if there were uh, employment discrimination statute that protected on the basis of sexual orientation, I'm not going to sue my colleague. Right, I have better things to do with my time. He's my friend, et cetera, et cetera. Right, so there are other ways in which we have to have that conversation, right? And the way I like to put it is that the reason that these cultures are so sticky, and you've heard me say this in this talk before, so forgive me, but uh, I think it's a powerful way of putting it, is that the demands are so infinite and they're so infinitesimal that they're very hard to combat. You know, they're so tiny and they're so multifarious that you know, one policy or one law is not gonna be able to do it. So what's the answer? I think the answer is to meet them where they occur, right, and to have the essential conversations, uh, Sarah Lawrence Lightfoot is in the audience, so I can't resist, right, with the uh, uh, individuals who are making these covering demands on us. So did I go back and confront the individual who had made the uh, de covering demand on me? You bet I did, right? Uh, did I wait until after I had tenure to do so? You bet I did. Right? <laughs> right. So I think what's really important is that individuals close the circle Right, and to actually push back when that demand is made. I think the reservation that I have is, and I think that the tricky bit about this and the importance of allies bit of it is that it's often people who are the most disempowered in the exchange who experience the covering demand, right? And so it's very hard for them to initiate that conversation. So ways of facilitating that conversation, right, is another reason why I go to the ethical bystander. There's one other thing um, that I'd love to say at this point, just to clarify, and, and this is really just a riff off of what you said. Um, you focused on the demand that my colleague had made on me, and I really appreciate that because uh, I think that you're correctly apprehending that my project really has to do with covering demands rather than covering performances, right? So I like covering much more as a word that modifies a word demand yeah. than as a word that modifies performance because I don't want to look at, say, the black woman who has straightened her hair or the gay person who's not working on, on gay rights and say, oh, that person is covering, because I have no idea, right? So I would have to psychoanalyze that person and that would often be really insulting for me to do, right? Uh, there are lots of gay people who don't want to work on gay rights. I just happen to be one of the people who did, right? But when we shift from covering performances to covering demands, right, the landscape becomes much clearer as to what we're actually battling because the statement, if you want to get tenure here, you should not write on gay issues, right, is a naked covering demand, right? And so we can ask people to retire those covering demands without essentializing a group as having certain characteristics. Right. So thank you. Hi, I'm Matthew. I'm a fourth year doctoral student um, in quantitative policy analysis. I'm a lawyer by training, so. Um, so to what extent do you think that law is impotent to affecting changes in covering demands? And I ask this because um, you talk about law as providing a floor mm -hmm. um, with respect to um, ending racial discrimination. But is it, is it fair to say that law provides a structure for entering that conversation, that without, without that structure we would not have moved as quickly as we did because we were fairly entrenched for centuries um, on a lot of aspects of discrimination. And if so, what does that mean for covering? Great, 
a beautiful question. Thank you for the beautiful question. Um, so I, I fear that this is also the last question because I've just gotten a cue that we're um, uh, out of time from our good dean. Um, but let me uh, start by saying that I'm not one of these uh, law doesn't matter uh, people. It's funny, uh, Jim and I, as we were coming in, we were just having a conversation about how much law and particularly litigation and court decisions, which many people like Jerry Rosenberg and the Hollow Hope have said did nothing, right? Uh, actually have done a lot in the marriage equality movement. So um, in my, my forthcoming book, all that, you know, if we're talking about something like marriage equality, all, the only way we can get that is through law, right? So I'm by no means a, a doomsayer or a naysayer when it comes to uh, the efficacy of law, right? And I'm not even a uh, naysayer with regard to law in certain respects with regard to uh, the covering project, although I would say that uh, law is going to be much less efficacious in the realm of covering than it is going to be in the realm of marriage equality, right, for some of the reasons that I've outlined, that this is so fine-grained, you know, people who are making the demands on us are often our friends and our colleagues and people who we wouldn't want to sue. There are many identities that are not protected under the law, you know, like, you know, being a veteran or, you know, at the federal level, even being gay is not protected, you know, because ENDA hasn't passed. Uh, so, you know, the law can't step in because we don't have the legislation that would support us. But all of that said, I do think that there is some room for law in the covering demand here. And let me just articulate that to you, sort of, if I may, lawyer to lawyer uh, for a second, and say the promise here actually lies in the disparate impact analysis. And I'll both lay out the promise and I'll lay out the way in which it's failed. So the way in which the disparate impact uh, doctrine has promised. So for those of you who are have the blessed um, state of not being lawyers in the audience, let me explain disparate impact very briefly. Uh, under discrimination law, we have disparate treatment and disparate impact. Disparate treatment is intentional discrimination. So I intentionally discriminate against you because of your race. Disparate impact is no intent, right? You don't have to show intent or prove intent, and the person doesn't have to have intent, but a gross uh, disparate impact right, on a protected group such that it calls, it, you don't win simply because of disparate impact, but if you can imagine as a kind of tennis match, if you can show disparate impact, the tennis ball goes sailing back over the net and the other person has to hit back by saying, we have a business related justification for why we impose this policy, right? And if they can't come up with a business related justification, then they lose, right? So they at least ha are put to their answer. They have to give an answer. They can't remain silent or they lose. So why wouldn't disparate impact be a great thing for covering, right? Because if you have, say, a formal policy, as American Airlines once did, uh, that a woman can't wear cornrows, this is now long gone, but you know they used to have a formal policy that hair had to be neat and cornrows were not permitted. Or if you have, you know, to take a contemporary example, one of these workplaces that have English-only uh, rules where you can only speak English in the workplace, both of those policies are gonna have a disparate impact on racial uh, minorities or national origin minorities, right? But that, so that's a promise, right? So I'm saying that the law could do something there, but the law has not done something there. And so what happens? What interrupts this seemingly very promising framework? So the way many judges have treated the disparate impact claim in the English-only workplace uh, context is an individual will say, I spoke Spanish and I was fired. Right, uh, because I broke the English only workplace policy. Uh, and then the employer says, I have no discriminatory intent against Latinos, we just have this English only workplace policy. Right? Uh, and then the uh, plaintiff says, I don't care that you don't have discriminatory intent. That knocks out my disparate treatment claim. It doesn't knock out my disparate impact claim because this has a grossly disparate impact on individuals whose first language is not English and therefore on people whose national origin is other than you know, Anglo. So you know, I'll have a disparate impact on Latinos, for example. Right? How do the courts respond to that? They respond in one of two ways to defeat the plaintiff's claim. One is to say that language is a mutable attribute. And so if something is mutable, then it can't really have an impact on you because you can always change, right? Uh, and if something doesn't have an impact on you, it can't have a disparate impact on you. In other words, you could have engaged in the self-help of assimilation to 
uh, make this problem go away, so the onus is on you. So the claim that you can change transmutes into the claim that you should change. The descriptive claim transmutes into the normative claim very, very quickly without any intervening investigation by the court. Second way, even if the court doesn't take that route and says, yes, you have a disparate impact claim, the second way in which these claims are defeated is that the employer says, we have a reason for these English-only workplace uh, policies, and that reason is that it disrupts hierarchies so that if uh, a bunch of people on the shop floor are speaking Spanish to each other and I, as their employer, don't know Spanish, can't speak Spanish, they could subvert lines of authority by teasing me or by uh, uh, subverting my authority in other ways, in ways that I would not understand, right? And so in order for me to re retain my hierarchy, I would have to um, uh, impose this English-only workplace and force them into a language that I can understand. Uh, so this actually is exactly what uh, French colonists did in Africa to force people to speak French, but I pass over that lightly. Anyway, uh, so what many courts have done is to say that actually counts. You know, the, you know, the, the, it's, it is business-related, it is a business-related justification to have these lines of hierarchy, so to preserve those lines of hierarchy, we need an English-only workplace. And so the plaintiff loses on that ground if he hasn't lost well before then. So I look at this and I think, Golly, like there's got to be something more going on here than you know simple um, racism on the part of the judge or kind of deep you know, lack of sympathy with regard to uh, this particular issue. There's so many kind of uh, intellectual cartwheels that are being turned here that there's got to be something else driving this. And I think that the something else is the explosive pluralism in this country that people are worried. Right? When, when you're protecting individuals based on skin color or national origin or other immutable aspects of their identity, then uh, that's actually a finite set. But I think courts are very, very worried about thinking about protecting individuals from covering demands because covering is behavioral and cultural, and the cultural appurtenances to all of these identities are so thick right, and so various that there would just be an endless flood of litigation, and that's what the courts fear. So I think that that's why they go through all these machinations to essentially denude disparate impact claims with regard to covering demands. All that said, and this will be my final point for the evening, everything that I've said about uh, the values forcing conversation of, you know, if somebody imposes a covering demand on you, it's not per se good or bad, but if you believe that it's inconsistent with your own values or the organization's value, you have to hit back and say, you know, I think that you're not living up to your values, right? So please live up to your values or explain why I'm wrong or seeing this incorrectly, right? And so that values forcing conversation is directly borrowed from the tennis match of disparate impact litigation. Of the idea is that once you make a prima facie case, which is a very, very de minimis case, the tennis ball goes over to the other side of the net and the employer has to hit it back. Once the employer hits it back by producing a non-discriminatory reason, you have to hit back and say that that reason was uh, pretextual and the real reason was discriminatory. That would be the disparate treatment analysis. Similar analysis I won't go through again, but I've articulated with regard to disparate impact. That back and forth, that dialogue, that set of forced call and answer, right, is something that I deeply am drawing on. And I was actually talking to Sarah before uh, this uh, forum and saying that you know lawyers are probably at one end of the spectrum and the ed school's probably at this end of the spectrum and having that humane conversation. But I think that we can both learn from each other. You know, I think that you know, Sarah and others can teach us how to make that conversation more humane and less adversarial. But I think that the lawyers can teach the ed school people to have the candid conversation, to have the uncomfortable conversation, to have the adversarial conversation at times that is necessary for a problem that is this intractable and this pervasive. Thank you.